We at Church of the Lakes believe we are a church on the move as we work toward connecting all to Christ to become healthy in God and courageous in love. Okay, well, we are, uh, as part of our year-long series on Core 52, we are looking uh, at a section that we're calling Master Leader. And some of the leadership qualities that we see lived out in Jesus Christ uh, that we're going to be looking at for the next four weeks. And, you know, I was talking to my nephew recently. Uh, he's a principal down in the Houston area. And he had had this guy, I, I was unfamiliar with him, but he's kind of a well-known in leadership circles, named John Gordon. And he's written a couple different books. And he'll go all over the country giving these motivational talks and collecting not a small chunk of change uh, to give these kind of core lessons, uh, you know, in different eras. I guess there's um, the lady uh, who's a part of uh, Shark Tank, uh, Barbara Corcoran. Uh, I, I don't watch Shark Tank, but Barbara. Is that who it is? Anybody watch Shark Tank? Barbara? Okay, Barbara, uh, you too can have Barbara come and speak at your leadership conference for a mere $100,000. She will fly out to you, and, and she will give you a, a presentation about the power of leadership. And, you know, I, I've been uh, to different kind of seminars, talks, uh, that, you know, about how you demonstrate positive leadership. You know, you're always going to have the, the theme of persistence. You're always going to have the, the theme of overcoming challenges. That's another uh, theme that kind of comes out. And uh, those uh, kind of, you know, hang in there. That's the main theme of leadership. Uh, that what you begin to see is that many of them are going to say that the strongest attribute of leadership are those who are willing to be servants to those under their care. And of course, uh, the first uh, model of what a real leader is all about was, of course, demonstrated by Jesus. In a Roman world, where often strength would be found through dominance, by uh, rank, and by military might, and Jesus came to show that the real nature of leadership is when you humble yourself and you care for those under your direction. And certainly a major theme that you're going to find throughout the New Testament in the very life of Jesus is this whole nature of humility. And I want to begin our four-point series on Master Leader by looking at what's often called the Christ Hymn. It is in Philippians chapter 4, or chapter 2, excuse me, Philippians chapter 2. And in it, you get a very, the very essence about who Jesus is all about. So I'd like you to join with me. Uh, we're going to be reading uh, ch ch Philippians chapter 2, 5 through uh, the first part of chapter 8. Will you please join with me in saying, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of slave, assuming human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a human, he humbled himself. Friends, this is God's word for God's people. Let's pray. Lord, I ask that the words of my mouth, the meditation of each of our hearts, it can be found loving and acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are our rock. You are our redeemer. Amen. About um, several years ago, actually been about 15 years ago, I, I read a book uh, by Stephen Ambrose entitled Band of Brothers. It was made into an HBO kind of mini-series. It, it follows a paratroop regiment that landed in uh, Europe right after D-Day in 1944 and kind of follows them throughout the course uh, of their campaign. And what uh, Ambrose did 
uh, really was the power of his narrative of getting into the lives of everyday uh, soldiers as they marched across to liberate uh, Europe and really the free world uh, from the tyranny of the Nazis uh, in 1944 and into 1945. And one of the things that particularly stands out is how he uh, features the two leaders of the platoon of the Band of Brothers, uh, Easy Company, they called it, part of the 101st Airborne Division. And the one was a Captain Sobel. Captain Sobel was the kind of guy who liked to throw his weight around, who liked to kind of exert his privilege and his position. And to the point where he would often uh, ask of his uh, troops, uh, the people under his command, to do things that he himself really was not willing to do. And as a result, Colonel Sobel was really pretty much loathed by the soldiers under his command. He was not beloved at all. But it's a sharp contrast to the second in command, Lieutenant Winters. Lieutenant Winters kind of operated with the mentality that he would always be willing to do what he would ask his troops to do. Uh, he would be right in in the midst with them, uh, kind of in getting his hands dirty uh, like his troops would do as well. And as a result, uh, Lieutenant Winters was really revered, beloved by those under his command. Uh, they're kind of as the band of brothers kind of hits a climatic moment, uh, Captain Sobel uh, begins to uh, be threatened by Lieutenant Winters and how well he was beloved by the troops under his command, the point that he demotes uh, Lieutenant Winters uh, in the Band of Brothers. And that creates kind of a, quote, mini-mutiny uh, that occurs uh, where the, uh, the people, the sergeants and the captains and the, pro or the, the sergeants and the lieutenant, or uh, the sergeants, the corporals, and the privates, they all kind of have a mini mutiny uh, within the ranks to the point where the colonel has to intervene. And what the colonel does is he actually elevates a Lieutenant Winters up to be a captain, and he demotes Captain Sobel, the arrogant, uh, the person who liked to throw his weight around, puts him in a desk role. And as the Band of Brothers kind of uh, unfolds, what we begin to learn is that by the end of the war, uh, Captain Winters, the one who was beloved, the one who was revered by his troops because of his humility, because of his willingness to not uh, kind of throw his weight around, was the one elevated. And the one who tried to use his rank and his privilege to push others down was actually pushed off to a desk job. And as the story of the Band of Brothers unfolds, ultimately kind of commits suicide. Well, what we begin to discover in life, as well as in uh, just kind of everyday uh, practice, that what we begin to uh, see is that those who humble themselves often find themselves in a position of leadership. And where they've learned that from is the Lord Jesus himself. Because what we have to realize that in the Roman world, in the Jewish world, by which Jesus lived within, that what often happened is that you found power through privilege, that you found power through dominance, you found power through military might. And here was this Jesus way that really turned the values of the world upside down. And the passage of scripture that is our memory verse for our core 52 comes to us from Philippians chapter 2. It is often called the Christ hymn. And most uh, writers uh, or most scholars of the Bible are going to tell you that the Christ hymn was formed as kind of a, uh, a sonnet, uh, a poem, to kind of teach what is the very nature of who Jesus Christ was all about. 
And considering that the letter of Philippians was written, uh, one of the early letters of Paul was written around 64, and that Jesus died around 32, that it had already been circulating. And what we begin to discover is, I think, the very first quality of a master leader, and that is humility. Let's kind of unpack a little bit about Philippians chapter 2. Uh, Paul writes, Jesus, being in the very same mind that was, or have your mind to be in the same that was in Christ Jesus, though he was in the very form of God. Now, the Greek word there is morphe, uh, the essence of God. And this is certainly a distinction between the Jesus way and all other world religions, all other philosophies. Because many philosophies or religions will have a God, but only Christianity has that this essence, this form of God entered into our human existence in the very form of Jesus Christ. And what I hope that you draw away from this sense that God, essence, his son came into flesh and blood, is that our physical matter matters to God. Because you see, what you have to realize is that for the Roman way, that they often felt that matter, physical nature, it would be impure, okay? It would be kind of less than. And, and that in Eastern religions, people like Hindus and, and Buddhists and those, they often think that matter is a mere allusion to what really exists. Christianity is unique of all the others to say that the very essence of God, his very son, came into our existence as flesh and blood, suffered as we suffered, uh, was tempted as we are tempted, died as we indeed died. The very essence, the Son of God, came into our world, the very form of our lives. And then, not only that, is that this form of God emptied himself. That word is kenosis. And kenosis uh, uh, is that sense that it really did the essence of emptying yourself into our existence, that God became one of us. And people have wrestled. Well, does that mean Jesus was 100% God or was Jesus 100% human? And, you know, well, maybe it's 50% God and 50% human. And for the better part of 400 years, the followers of Jesus wrestled with these very issues, people like Arius and Athanasius, they began to debate, what is the nature of who Jesus Christ was? But what we kind of always will come back to is that Jesus was from the beginning in form of God and that emptied himself into our existence. Why would God do that? Why would he become one of us? Well, friends... We've already been given the words of God. We've been given the commands of God. We've been given the prophets of God. And all along the way, people rebelled against that. And so he decided to go face to face with this very physical matter by sending his son, our savior, to be in flesh and blood and to humble himself. Not only that, uh, that he became a slave. The word is doulos. Uh, it means a bond servant. And you know, many times you'd think, well, if God sent his son, he'd be like Superman, could leap over a, a, you know, tall buildings in a single bound. He could fly faster than a speeding bullet. No, uh, this emptying of himself into our existence was as a slave, a humble person who uh, was born of a peasant in, a Nazareth, uh, in Nazareth, uh, from, Na from the village of Nazareth. Uh, this is the very qualities of our God. Now, what really difference does any of this make? 
Well, that's where I want to kind of come down to the qualities of master leaders. And that is the essence of humility. The word that is found in Philippians chapter 2 is he humbled himself, uh, taking the form of our flesh. It, you know, that humbleness is tapanos. And, and humility is the really reverse of what the world celebrates today. What is the world? What are you surrounded by constantly, the environment in which we live? It's all about expressive self individualism how do you kind of make your day amongst others it's how to elevate yourself okay that is the way of the world it's how you uh, exert power how you get more likes how you get more buzz it's all about lifting yourselves up that's the way of the world and yet christianity is the reverse it's about humility it's about getting your hands dirty. It's about rubbing shoulders with the earth. That's what humility is all about. Now, please hear me out. A lot of times people think that humility, that you got to think of yourself as like this lowly worm and have no self-esteem, and that's what humility is. No! Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Hear that? C.S. Lewis, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's about thinking of yourself less. Dostoevsky, the great uh, Russian author, he put it this way. At the sight of men's sins, always decide to use humble love. For if you resolve to do that once and for all, you can subdue the whole world. Loving humility is marvelously strong. You hear that? Loving humility is marvelously strong. It's the strongest of all things. There's nothing else quite like it. And so, how do we kind of live out humility in our day-by-day -day lives? Mark Moore, in his Core 52 material, I think he gives us some very practical, real things that can help us uh, and first of all, he says, make sure that we demonstrate, uh, or, or I'm sorry, that we associate with the lowly as if they were dignitaries. And that comes out of Romans uh, chapter 12, when we read uh, this passage of scripture. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty or arrogant. The opposite of humility is arrogance, right? Okay. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. I think the first very practical thing is to make sure that we really, we consciously associate with the lowly as if they were dignitaries. That means when you see somebody who is a common worker, uh, that you don't think of them as less of a human being. That means you're, you're, you're being haughty. Do not be haughty but associate with uh, the lowly as if they were dignitaries. Here's the second thing. Make sure that we prioritize children. In Mark chapter 10, you know, the disciples were trying to kind of push children away because children were seen as lesser human beings, okay? And Jesus said, do not suffer them. And do, do not let the children come unto me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God, okay? So first of all, uh, to associate with the lowly as they were dignitary. Secondly, prioritize children. Then thirdly, purposely put yourselves in humble places. There's that powerful story of when you're invited at, to a banquet. Don't sit there and try to, you know, uh, get to the very head of the table. But instead, to allow yourself in a lesser position so that others can get to a place of prominence. That is a conscious decision. Okay, that we daily make, to sit there and pr uh, purposely put ourselves in humble places. And then the final thing that Mark Moore mentioned is to serve. And he references uh, Jesus' uh, decision that on the night of his betrayal, that when they were getting ready to serve the Passover meal, uh, and usually a servant would go and wash the feet 
of the disciples and, and take up a basin and take up a towel. It was Jesus himself who knelt down at the grimy, smelly feet of the people who were his disciples underneath him and washed their feet and to serve them. And you know, as I mentioned, uh, I would love to have thought that this message on humility was kind of thought out well in advance that had to happen on the week we got back from Royal Family Kids Camp. But that was a God thing, and certainly not a Brian thing, as I planned that out. But I had kind of a holy moment this last week. One of my jobs uh, at Royal Family Kids Camp is, is I take uh, the children and their counselors down to a place called Split Rock. Split Rock, it's just this big boulder that you can kind of climb up uh, to. And, you know, it's a little challenging, but it's certainly, especially with the help of the counselors, uh, that they can make their way up to the very top. And the reason I'm appointed to do that is because I have the biggest mouth, okay? And I cheer, you know, you can do it, you can do it, you can make it. And they get up on top, and I kind of hoot and holler. You can hear me all the way across the other side of camp when they make it up to the top of the rock. And um, there was this moment when this young lady uh, was climbing up uh, the rock. And she didn't have her shoes on very tightly. And as she's climbing up, one of the shoes kind of fell off her foot and kind of tumbled down the rock. And, and I'm down at the bottom, and I caught it. And, and I was like, oh, no, you know, you got to make it up there just in your feet. And uh, I've had that happen before where there's been one shoe. But this girl then proceeded to lose her second shoe <laughs> and came tumbling down the rock, and, and I caught that. And... Uh, you know, but she made it all the way up, and we're all cheering for the counselors that are there. And, and so I took the shoe, and I, I threw it up, uh, up the rock, uh, to her counselor. Uh, her counselor is an executive in Diebold, uh, you know, really a uh, person of high position and rank, who spends a week to love on these kids. And in that moment, this counselor bent down, and proceeded to put these shoes on this little girl. And I thought, wow, you know, what is humility in a nutshell? And my prayer for us as a congregational family, that we can emulate, that we can model that very essence of who Christ is in our own homes, in our community, in our neighborhoods, that we begin to realize it's not about thinking of less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less, demonstrating real humility. And that's my prayer for all of us. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that each of us can reflect your son, poured his very essence into our lives, who lived as we lived, who suffered as we suffered, who died so that we could have eternal life in your name. And holy God, we know that we are surrounded by a world that likes to be haughty, that likes to kind of have expressive self-individualism. Help us instead to embrace humility as Christ served us. Help us to serve one another. We ask these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.